This week, Alex Chavaray, Chief Innovation Officer at Tuix Security, joins us for an interview where he tells us how hacking naked changed his life. Then I'll take you through attack surface mapping with a mass in our technical segment. In the security news, President Biden issues a 34-page executive order on cybersecurity. Did did you hear the the pipeline got got hacked? I don't know if anyone heard that no, yet. No, uh, new old Wi-Fi vulner, Wi-Fi vulnerabilities. Get this: Apple didn't want to talk about a malware attack that exposed its users. Fake Amazon review database. Why ad hoc scanning is not enough. Distrolist Linux. Wormable Windows bug. Could it be Code Red 2.0? Perhaps. The crypto wars continue. And more. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Cyber criminals are using social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard to detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda and welcome to the show but first let me introduce you to a man who has first-hand experience and can tell you the difference between a chickpea and a garbanzo bean mr paul acidorian welcome to paul security weekly this is episode number 694 being recorded on may 13th 2021 here in g unit studios in rhode island to my left on the screen remotely is Mr. Larry Pesce. Larry, welcome. Howdy. What's going on, Larry? Uh, uh, same stuff, different day. Uh, Fauci ouchie number two. And uh, yeah, feeling a little uh, feeling a little dumpy, but yeah. that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's Lee good Neely thing. is here with us. Lee, welcome. Uh, good to be here. We're having a glorious day over here and looking forward to a fun evening. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. With his hack naked shirt on backwards. Yeah, but it says hack naked, and I didn't know if the, if the front was uh, you know corporately acceptable anymore. So this is this is what you get, uh, and it's the most important anyway because it's got the definition. That's right. Sport in the hack naked shirt. Don't, and, go, don't uh, go too far up, Jeff. Don't go too far up. Oh don't yeah, not wearing I, pants. Not, not wearing <laughs> pants. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hack Tyler from the waist down. Tyler Robinson is here with us, back from VK. Tyler, welcome. Thank you very much. Enjoyed my uh, Puerto Rican experience, except I didn't get to see Carlos. I was, I was very sad. Aww. I didn't get to, to meet up. But, you have to go back. You know. uh, quick announcements. Do you want to stay in the loop? All things Security Weekly. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe via your favorite podcast catcher or our YouTube channel. Sign up for our mailing list, join our Discord server, and follow us on our newest live streaming platform. That's right, we're on Twitch. If you have a specific guest or topic you'd like us to cover on one of the upcoming shows, we'll cover those guests. Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Complete that form. And we do review those suggestions on a regular basis. It says monthly, but it sometimes it's monthly, sometimes not. Alex Chevrolet is a self-proclaimed information security geek who has experience in ethical hacking, cybersecurity, and penetration testing, and audiovisual design. He joins us today to talk about his choice of words when talking to you uh, with a prospective client uh, earlier on in his career and the truth that it revealed. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, well, I'm so happy to be here. It's nice to have you. Um, Alex, how did you get your start in information security? Oh, goodness. Um, so previously to joining a company, I loved reverse engineering and specifically video games. Mm. So the first exploit I did was an Unreal Tournament 2004, and that was uh, crashing all the gamers who played at our college who were slowing down bandwidth. So that started with 
a little bit more on the militia side in college, but then quickly found a love for information security and hacking, uh, got a, a degree in network security, and then jumped right in. Uh, jumped right into doing security testing, penetration testing, grew into it, did consulting for almost a decade, and then started my own company about mm, three years ago and been going. We, we decided to you know, launch it right in the middle of COVID, which was, which was great, but we are, we're thriving and it's awesome. Fantastic. Uh, what was your first? Hey, computer- hey, hey yeah. just want to quick interrupt, youngster. I've been consulting for twenty five years, so almost a decade doesn't sound like much to me. <laughs> I, oh, so, oh, I think it's actually probably close to about fourteen years, fourteen fifteen years. So more oh, than a decade. Oh, well, that's, but that's but totally still different. still nothing. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I was reading. I was. Did you say you launched a? Uh, what did you launch during the pandemic? I missed that. Uh, part. I, my own company. So I co-founded a company called Tuix Security Group, uh, and we oh, launched okay. it. Com- we, yeah. we launched the company, and we hired our first employee December of oh. 2019. So it was it was a great time to start a company. <laughs> it, but actually, I, mm. I think it is. You know, I think it's I think it's good to start a company when maybe the economy is not doing so well. Uh, although cybersecurity has been flourishing, but I think starting it in in challenging times gives you a, a unique perspective and a good mm. appreciation for you know when things are good, right? Yeah, I mean, it it we had to plant and pivot a few times where mm. we started and we're like, oh, this is the direction we're going to go in. We're going to be doing product security for X Y Z company. Like they wanted to jump in, and we were bu- building a platform to do third party vendor risk management. And then overnight, both those contracts kind of stopped. And we decided, we're like, great, we're going to go back to our roots and help people build and orchestrate security uh, programs. And it, it's been, as I said, it's been thriving. I mean, you get one client, and which leads to two. You get two, which leads to four. And now we're, you know, I think we have like 40 clients. It's absolutely crazy. Good for you, man. That's awesome. What kind of... What kind of challenges did you see and what kind of pivots did you see the industry make that were both from a security standpoint, uh, but also from just a general, like, hey, we're in a pandemic. What kind of things did you kind of notice as from the consulting side? Like, this is very interesting. We've seen a lot of companies kind of fail at this. And we've seen a lot of companies, like you said, thrive uh, at a time when there's recession happening and, and people are losing jobs. So what kind of uh, pivots did you see companies making that were both good for you and good for the industry? Mm-hmm. I think most of everything we saw came down to two sides. I think most companies jump into the tactical things right away. Like, okay, we're going to close systems. We're going to patch them. We're going to do all the tactical things. I think what has given us a lot of success is building everything based off of programs, whether it's the NIST framework, ISO, high trust, and going back to the basics, going, what what is the framework? What are the framework controls? What are the policies you have which adhere to those controls? What are the procedures you're doing to satiate those policies? And then what is the evidence that you're collecting to satiate your procedures, which satiate the policy, which then fulfills the framework? Instead of just coming in and saying, okay, you have to do a pen test. You have to secure your SDLC. You have to do this. But coming up with a high-level program and then helping them organize that into consumable pieces. I mean, I know it's like it's security 101, but it, it seems that every company we talked to was remarkably tactical in its approach and never tied it back to a, a full-on program. Yeah, we definitely need more of that, for sure. It's been that way for over 25 years. <laughs> Jeff, I, I think Jeff one of the biggest Alex. Alex is taking it remarkably well. <laughs> I mean, I think one 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 thing that we probably the biggest one is we always start with that like k- again KPIs and KRIs. Uh, the, what's your key performance indicator? What's your key risks? And setting up what are your company objectives and tying those to security because I don't care what anyone says. Security doesn't have an ROI. You need to tie it to what the company objectives are, and then all of a sudden you can start justifying security like. With product security, oh, well, if, we, if our clients are demanding we ha- have to be high trust, we can tie that to revenue goals. We can't do that if we just go tactical on everything. Yeah, I think you know, it's- and, that, and I'm not really baiting on Paul, but you know, that, what, he just, what, what Alex, what you just said is worth repeating. There is no ROI in security. Uh, on a good day, nothing bad happens. 
Well, I think that, you know, that certainly isn't a revenue generator, but measuring return is certainly something you can do with respect to security. You know, I think if you wipe out a lot of your technical debt and you implement new uh, products and services that are replacing the old and providing a better service to your customers, not only are you more secure, but you're also improving your bottom line and not directly through security, which, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's I think, what you guys are, are talking about. But I think there's an overarching strategy to a more closely align security to the business rather than just making it a sheer cost center. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing which has given us a significant advantage as far as uh, just new direction is we've started tying solutions or we'll say like objectives within the company to more, I'm going to say articulated risk. So when we actually looked at all the tests, all the pen tests that we've done over the past, you know, 15 years, and then even the ones in the industry, it's not it's we always laugh like anytime i hear a security company going oh we have customized proprietary software and we come in with zero days like we always laugh we're like no you don't like no no one's gonna even if you had a zero day you're not gonna waste it on a company so we actually just looked at them and said wait how are people getting in you know yep security awareness things like that but like credential stuffing like credential stuffing is such an obvious issue that has gone on but there's not really an easy way of testing against it so the one of the first things we did for one of our clients was we went through we purchased every breach database we could find we added it to our databases that we had been maintained we came up with i don't know a 28 billion records organized it searched through our clients and then we set up like again it's simple scripting but one of the biggest things we did is we grabbed we we search through it we what we call dredging we dredge through grab every password related to that client which is related to an email which they've had run grab that information run it against their active directory put it into a, a block list so those passwords can't get set and then trigger resets to everyone who has one of those passwords and like it was a something really practical we did it was a solution that doesn't seem to be out there. And I don't know why, because it seems like a one-on-one thing. There are some attack awesome. surface management companies that, uh, in our recent test that do some of that. Um, but you know, how much of the breach data are they collecting and comparing it against? They did get one of our accounts that was, that was in some breach data. Um, but it doesn't sound as comprehensive as what, like 20, when you say 28 million or billion records? A billion. But again, it includes <clears throat> like, that includes paste bins and mm -hmm. buckets and thi a lot. I mean, there's so much. Like if you if you look at through like have I been pwned? Like there's so many sparse records mm. in there. So like 23 billion of like actual records, we'll call them. But there's so much just junk data on top of it too. And yeah. you guys are really really good at regex and normalizing data. I'm just gonna say like having done that myself, mm. that's a pain in the ass. You know what the hardest one was is addresses like physical yes. addresses we do too like there's no easy way of of regexing them no they're all formatted differently and for the love of god no one knows how to do an address in a standardized manner or comma separate anything <laughs> like one of the like in the way we do it is we organize it so they can understand it but like simple things we did is like we'll take all the usernames associated with emails and run those like do those exist in active directory and we've had some, which is kind of amazing that the Active Directory accounts, but then there's other things we do, like inject sparse records into their Active Directory and then monitor for those. But just simple regex remove tons of data. Like, is there an at sign with a period inside the email? If not, just toss it away. But it was kind of fun doing like simple regex and then eliminating just a million, like 10 million records. And it was like, wow, I you felt really... Um, efficient you like wrote one script and then eliminated like two percent of all your data and you're like wow okay i i feel really good about that reg hacks that's a call yeah. to yeah. call right there <laughs> the acquisition of all that breach data though and like maintaining it and keeping up to date and all those forums and personas and that's a that's a pretty big task that's pretty cool you guys are doing that for your active directory um querying and, and the way you're doing this is this automated and are you interacting using something like .NET or powershell to to do this we're we've scripted it all ourselves so far it's a combination of uh, like 
Lambda scripts, Python, and PowerShell. Um, amazingly <laughs> enough, like a lot of it was just piecemealed together, like not piecemealed together, but like pulled a lot of open source projects on GitHub did what we wanted to, but they didn't string them together. Mm-hmm. Things like detect uh, detect when a new password enters the Active Directory, grab that and then convert that this way. Like most of the testing we're doing though, we push stuff down and then uh, it all happens on the client site. So like we never, we do, the only thing we pull back to our platform would be uh, just the statistics. That's pretty cool. That's a great way to do that. And honestly, from a client side standpoint, like most clients are going to be much more agreeable to that than the opposite way as some companies have figured out. Yeah, like we we kind of, I feel like I was never, so I have a different background than most people who were in this industry. Like I wasn't a software developer. I became one throughout, like had to learn code along the way. I was that, I was that weird person in security who didn't, who didn't, wasn't, didn't have a programming background. So now actually building the software, I feel like I've done a bunch of paranoid things that probably aren't needed in my code. But just, I kind of just assume that every piece of it could be hacked at one point, so I just don't trust any of it. I don't know if they're needed, but they probably need to be there that people who have been developing software don't build in. I found myself doing, even with a software background, when I started you know, like developing our own internal application and users started using our software rather than just me using it for myself. I was like, wow, I got to code like really defensively, like really, you know, do a lot of stuff that I normally like wouldn't do, right? Like one, the coolest package though that I found across all of this, and again, I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't know how public it is, but it's it's all a SQL. It is the coolest thing because we'll pull down packages of JSON, and then you can query JSON as if it's a SQL database. Oh, so cool. you can do a remarkable amount of powerful stuff inside the client browser with. SQL. There's some gems in in, in GitHub, and I, I think you're onto something there. Alex is kind of a uh, a good recommendation to our audience that you don't necessarily have to build all the software yourself. Like even in my tech segment that I'll give next, like I strung together a bunch of open source projects, and if you find the right ones, it, you can really accomplish some amazing things without really writing a lot of code at all. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'll I'll. I'll add to that, which I think is probably one of the coolest things I built like in my tenure is so before Death Star was a thing, we strung um it was we called it Project Loki, but essentially it was PowerShell Empire, it was a uh, NTLM Relay X, it was Death Star, and it was essentially a you put all those things together, it's essentially a worm to just drop on the network. We did it through you would send the client a Raspberry Pi. It would spin up a Docker image, which would add WireGuard. Then you essentially did like a reverse VPN over it, ran your Death Star, Relay X, MT, um, Man in the Middle V6, and you could send a Raspberry Pi and then automatically launch essentially the full attack, which then would launch shells. And every time it launched a shell, we'd get a Slack, um, mm-hmm. a Slack message back. But it was like, the entire thing took maybe four hours to code and it was just stringing all these awesome open source projects together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's what attackers are doing today. I mean, there are certain attack groups. I mean, they're basically just sitting back on waiting for shells to be shoveled to them. And they're, I I think they're not even doing anything with them other than just selling them to the next ransomware group that is making a lot of money today from what I've read. (laughs) I'm not sure if you have talked about this on the segment, but have you have you what what's your consideration? What's your thoughts on GitHub's new security tool policy there, which they're talking about? Yeah, we touched on it last week, and it um, I think their language was something along the lines of any tool that had criminal or unlawful intent, and like and that was like their update. And I'm like, like, but like, how do you? So what is that? Okay, so like if you have a knife, like you you can't have that because you could stab people with it, or like you could chop vegetables too, but like it's still a, a knife. How do you how do you know what the intent is? Yeah, I, I would imagine like even certain even PowerShell, like there's so many PowerShell scripts which are just droppers, mm-hmm. which you could use for patching. You could also use it for all sorts of malicious things. Was it there, I remember there was also some discussion in that particular stuff of, uh, on the GitHub part about um, using GitHub and such as uh, C2 
uh, so you know, gathering commands and yeah, sending data there and and so forth. Um, which, like, the, there was also some language about whether you're doing this, you know, with permission or not. I'm like, how would they gonna how are they gonna tell whether someone's doing it with permission? It gives them a lot of latitude to do kind of what they want, uh, where they see their discretionary <laughs> function uh, willing. I don't know. It's it's not great, I think, from a code platform because code is not evil or unevil until it's utilized. And so that kind of is making that gray box uh, black and white. So it's interesting. Uh, so attrition.org made a pull request to the F-Secure Labs C3 uh, repo and changed the readme to say that this framework is not just for for red teams as they had originally stated but it's also a malicious ransom used by malicious ransomware teams and referenced the fire eye right up on the dark side ransomware because it used c3 from f secure i mean there's things like i don't know like there's things like cobalt strike which we which have been used within apts it, but i've used it i think it's a great it's a great c2 platform if you're looking for an easy one but like the thing which I, I I feel like there has to be a balance is there's also like full blown living off the la land yeah. ransomware. Like DEF CON had one at DEF CON, I don't know, 20, 28, 29, or 20, I think it was 28, where it was a full blown living off the land ransomware with Bitcoin integration and everything like that, which was fully undetectable. Like, now, fully undetectable, I mean, yeah, you can do integrity checking and all of that, but like that's it's on GitHub right now. 7-Zip uh, just had the same thing, what, two weeks ago with the 7-Zip ransomware? Yeah. So, so like, what's the balance there? Like, would you, again, it, someone has to make the decision, but can you throw just rant? Like, if, it, if it's not on GitHub, it's going to be somewhere else. Then, like, let's use Unicorn. Unicorn's another great example of it is easily used for malicious to make payloads fully undetectable. Yet, it, it because it's on GitHub, Microsoft can just monitor the repo, and every time there's new pull request, they just generate new signatures. Mm -hmm. Like because it's public, it makes it so much easier for them to make signatures. Yeah, yeah again, but it just I don't be, think it's be public somewhere else. There's that, and I don't. I think it's just the fact that they wanted the latitude to make a decision on it without having to, you know, tell everybody their their intent and add it to the EULA, right? Yeah. So, like, I mean, basically, what that means is if it affects Microsoft products, they'll probably pull it. Oh, <laughs> 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 saying. Do we have your word on that? I, I I think we've already seen that, right? Didn't they pull down the exploit code for one of the the recent vulnerabilities in uh, Exchange, Change. right? Yep. No. Yeah, I, I see Presidents this being a problem. Head. Yeah, There's going to be another company that stands up just like GitHub or more GitLabs are going to happen or there's just going to be a, a mass repo in Exodus that, again, like, what is it helping? It's just making it harder to build signatures and or utilize code. It should be gray. Like, code is not evil. Maybe there's a t-shirt there somewhere. Mm. I mean, clearly some of the crypto miner stealers are like literally called crypto miner stealer. Like, can that live on GitHub or not? And is it about the name? Like, if, if my knife looks evil, does that mean yeah. it's bad? <laughs> what if you're using it to test to see if you can detect crypto miner stealers? Right. Or, again, like, there's a lot of use cases. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think Microsoft's been kind of big on the, you need to know what the exploit is and have the exploit code so you can, you know, basically tune your defenses and detection uh because i mean they sometimes don't release stuff until you know after they fixed it but you know the exploits out there and they don't release a lot of details i mean they're not as bad as apple we'll talk about that in the news but still um alex i wanted to transition uh to how we found you because <laughs> you made this really really funny video and like i mean we can give you like a little of the background on on hack naked larry i think i we were messaging on probably like ICQ or Jabber, or like before there was, was Slack and Discord. Yeah. It, it was like Jabber, or it was definitely was not ICQ, but it was likely some other uh, instant messaging, you know, uh, AOL Instant Messenger, Jabber, most likely Jabber, um, about like coming up with slogans for the show. And we got down the co ed naked mm. stuff, which led to 
nakedness and hacking naked. We said hack naked, and we're like, yeah, we all like That's that. It. Like all the messages were like, yes, 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 yes. Larry's like, I'll do the logo. It like I don't. It wasn't that long after that, Larry. You're like, here's a logo. And I'm like, that's great. Let's print some T-shirts and go to ShmooCon. And that's basically how it started. I mean, there was literally that much thought put behind it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, I mean, that's that's a lot of what we do, right? Or we used to do, anyways. There wasn't a lot of thought behind it. Yeah, we just um. it was like, yeah, it was just just momentum, and we were going. And before we know, we were at ShmooCon, and what was that 06, Larry? 06 or 07? Oh. 06. I think it was 06. It was 06, yeah. We were at ShmooCon. Heidi was kind enough. I don't know why she did, only because she's awesome. She's like, yeah, you guys can totally like buy a booth and uh, sell those hack naked t-shirts. <laughs> like, thank you. And we sold out every single one of them. And yep. there began the whole hack naked thing. So. So. How, and then we, how did Alex come to us? Fast forward many, many years later, and we see a, a, a video from, from Alex. So, Alex, what was your story behind hacking naked? Oh, it was it was mostly... I'll blame DEF CON. I'll blame you guys as well. Uh, it was... I had just come back from DEF CON, so that's probably... I, the story was a while ago. It was at the beginning of my consulting career. I think it would have been... It was right at. It was six months after I started with the my last company. What year do you think it was? It, like it where, would have been. Was DefCon at the Rio? No, it would have been before. No, nah, it would have been two thousand nine, maybe two thousand ten. Mm, where was DefCon in two thousand nine and Rivi ten? Riviera. It was Riviera. Riviera. Yeah, it was Riviera. Riviera. Yep. And we Might were have been there. the year we had the party. Yeah. yeah. Yep, so we had, it, we had the party. They had the skyboxes over uh, CTF, yep. and uh, that was also where the life-size cutout of uh, Larry made an appearance at the booth. Yep, could be. <laughs> so the story goes on is what happened was, at this point, I had traveled. Um, so the company had, they were a consulting company. They were dedicated to a specific client, and then they did some remote work. And I was I joined, and they had me dedicated to this client, and I had traveled there nine out of 11 weeks. So I was about to quit on the spot because like most companies, they're like, oh, you don't, you're, you only have to travel 25% and that's it. You never have to travel any more than that. And then nine out of 11 weeks, I was newly married. Like I wanted to be home. I started questioning like, what, like, wh why would I, why am I, why do I even have a home? Like, well, there, there's no, I'm never there. Mm. So I got an opportunity. Um, funny enough is actually my business partner now was the salesperson at the company. And that's how gotcha. this was one of the ways we met and got along. He pulled me into an opportunity uh, with this, this remote gig and the client what it, it represented so much because if I would have got, if I would get this gig, it was going to be a lot of follow on work. So I dialed into the conference call and the call was going well. Like we, you know, typical scoping call. Here's what the here's what we're thinking about for the project. What do you need? What are you thinking? And they it was actually a really cool product. What the product was is they built it in house. It was for auditing um, connections. So they have these engineers come in. It was a hedge fund. They have engineers and traders come in and connect over to another system, and it would do screen recording, it would, like an endpoint software. And it what would happen at one point of the conversation. He said, oh, well, you're, when you go to test this, it might have some issues or it might trigger your antivirus because what it's really doing is it's, it's tying in here and sometimes it, it triggers it. And at this point of the conversation, the guy was geeking out quite a bit. So it was like the video goes in like I just blew and said this, but it was like a calculated decision. But on the other side of things, it was kind of just like in my mind from DEF CON thinking I was young. You know, I'm it hedging sounded a bunch. Good, it sounded good in your head. And then once you verbalized <laughs> it, you were like, oh, maybe I shouldn't I have said that. It was, it was like one of those things like I, I, I for some reason, I, again, I thought it was like a known industry term. Like I didn't realize it had just originated and hadn't made its <clears throat> rounds yet. So without thinking, I was like, Oh, don't, don't worry. That's not going to be a problem. I hack naked. And it was just silence on the phone. Like <laughs> awkward in, in that, <laughs> oh gosh, in that split second of silence, I remember all these things flying through my head going like, just like, Ah, like, like, like oh, can my, I put my it back? My resume is not up to date. <laughs> like, like, 
Like he's gonna like th- this was it. This was the opportunity. I'm gonna be traveling again. It's not coming around. Like God, what did I just do? And then a couple heartbeats go by, Which and then all of a sudden, like, it felt like minutes though. Right? Oh, it was just yeah. it, was, <laughs> it was so time slows bad. down. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the client just busts out laughing, and then you get this nervous laugh from the sales guy, like he's like, uh, uh, like. Look, I'm not in the joke. And he's like, look, what? He goes, I think I know what that is. Like, I saw something about that because he had, he was communicating with people who have just came back from DEF CON and he had heard the phrase and it started fun. So circling back around this client, I became a client of ours. Like we've had, we have now had a relationship for 14, 15 years at this point from this conversation but I said, you know, hack naked, and then he busted out laughing, and he the the whole rest of the conversation was on DefCon and Darknet and what challenges I was doing and what type of hacking I did, and it, it without a doubt it was that phrase the the hack naked like I oh yeah hack naked which we would have never talked about DefCon and and mm. conferences and what projects I had worked on without that phrase, and the call was scheduled for 15 minutes and it went like an hour uh, just jumping into all the different challenges and hacking hacking we had been doing that's really funny i wonder if we had uh actually been publicizing the definition or if it was just like a a cultural thing that we explained to people yeah well we would explain the the meeting to people and i think it was ed scotus that kind of helped us shape the the different meetings of you know what other than sitting naked at your computer that it means when you do a pitch, you know, I think it was Ed that, at least the way I remember it, that he uh, said, you know, it's when you're doing a pen, you don't want anything to inhibit you. And therefore, it's, it's more of the concept of being, you know, <laughs> naked when you're doing a pen test to make sure nothing like antivirus or firewalls or anything else gets in the way. I mean, in, in the funny part is even years later, I'm now still like you, you do a pen test and you're using an AWS system or I mean, uh, not, uh, uh, EC2 system going like, wait, shoot, I need to open up the full firewall. Yeah. I need to make sure there's no security on it. I need to make sure reverse connections will come back. I mean, the, the biggest change from that story, though, wasn't this relationship I kept with a client. It wasn't even the sale and then it ended up moving on to more remote work. The change was like, for some reason, in my mind, a security consultant was someone who was very professional always presented himself as just a, a, a security consultant in a tie and always talked in rules and firewall rules and how you could better adequately fulfill your compliance needs. I, I don't know. like, And it wasn't like a geek. It wasn't like a hacker and just like a, a goofball, which is like you go to DEF CON. That's like what we all are. And it mm-hmm. was it changed the way I, I presented myself to clients moving forward. It wasn't like that stiff like dude. It was that like... <laughs> Woo, let's 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 talk about hacking right now because like it's how can you not be excited when you talk about it? Mm. Yeah, and I feel I, like say you, um, you got to be comfortable in your in your own skin. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, to I, be naked, I think that makes sense. I mean, I also hack I, in the nude just just to yeah. make sure that we all know that. And I love that wait, in the video. Wait, what you don't? Because <laughs> I I will fully admit that there have been some summer days when the air conditioning hasn't worked, and yeah. No air conditioning. Yeah. You, you got to make sure you're not sweating on more than you need to. The the phrases that made it into the video and were actually said in real life was in right after that moment happened. Every, he started laughing, so that was the that's the one part of the story which I, I I was trying to remember back if I started saying them. I'm pretty sure I heard him chuckle, and then I doubled down, and I'm like, ah, screw it, okay, I'm screwed anyway. Might as well just go for it. I'm like, well, I just don't like anything to be between me and the code. I just like to be unfettered in my testing. And I just, I find all of this just between us, just, it's, it's just really restrictive when I get into the code. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Jeff, I, I kind of feel like, um, I, I, I want to see the sequel and I, I, and I'm envisioning kind of an, it's a wonderful life kind of moment where you see the alternate reality. If, if you had never been exposed to hack naked and you continued on as the, your vision that you just described is what a con, you know security consultant should be. It's one of my and, favorite and, Star Trek, the next generation episodes, Jeff, where captain Picard sees his life as they hadn't gotten stabbed yep. and gotten in the fight. Right. Right. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was trying to think of other examples. That's one of them. Um, uh, you know, there's others out there, but you know, just sort of that, you know, if, if you, you know, if you'd never had that aha moment as it were, you know, how, how different your life might be, make it humorous, make it, make it a, make it a melodrama, but deserves to be made while you think about that just if you haven't seen that episode of star trek uh captain mccarty gets stabbed when he was younger because he gets into a fight later on in his career when he's a captain uh he i forget what happened but he's uh it has an, another medical issue that that stab wound kind of comes back to haunt him and he almost dies in his visions he's kind of regretting getting in that fight and being so kind of wild and, and brazen envisions his life and he's not a captain in this life where he doesn't take as many risks right he's no, kind of he's a, like a yeoman or he's something like, like a petty that. officer very low or, ranking. right yep. equivalent in you know trying to appeal to captain Riker uh in this alternate reality of like hey how could yep. i like move up in the ranks he's like well yeah you kind of like i don't know if you have what it takes right so something to be said for for taking risks right yep. see so, see now letting my imagination run wild i envision alec in that alternate reality um uh clean shaven in a sh in a suit right, yeah. uh working for one of the big five uh <laughs> firms doing audit work showing up on client sites on time. on time all the time properly dressed yes <laughs> oh probably would still be at general electric <laughs> 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 that's where i was working before that and left and i probably would have went back there i mean i actually this is like moment of truth moment of honesty i probably because if i wouldn't have done that i wouldn't have gotten more remote work i would have quit and mm -hmm. i would have went back to general electric which would not have been th there's a there's a lot of things that would have happened because if i wouldn't have stayed with this company this company like um my last one pushed me to go to defcon more and more and more and it, like they would pay for my all, all of it but like at defcon i ended up going on to win a black badge i got involved with the darknet contest i helped run it with those operatives that's also if you uh there's another video i did on my youtube channel which was um defcon 27 gulo and gauri who duplicated or forged the badge the ge the uh the stone gem one with a urinal cake and then like yeah, th those guys have changed my life too so like there there's quite a few little chinks that would have happened if if there if i wouldn't have just doubled down on hack naked i love how like the ridiculous phrase that we came up with on a whim back in the day has influenced you and likely others in, in the same kind of way i think it's really funny Oh, you know, like that phrase is like an official phrase. Like it's defined. You can find it all online, but like it's weird when you hear it echoed back where you're like, oh, yeah, just make sure you're hacking naked. Mm. Like I, I'm pretty sure it's on like the OSCP forums too, saying like, oh, well, you know, when you're doing your OSCP exam, make sure that you're hacking naked. Like it's just like part, it's a coined term. It's part of the vernacular now. That's really funny. Jeez. And if I could only get an entry on Wikipedia, like it'd be complete. <laughs> We do have a we do have an official U.S. trademark uh, on Hack Naked. Really? We do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mostly so people you know don't copy it, and so you know we can own it. But yeah, you know, people. Some people have asked to make T-shirts, and I'm like, ah, that's that's fine. Like whatever, you know. <laughs> but yeah. some people have used it in their own video podcast series. It's okay. Nah, that's, that's fine too. That's I think it's only if you're like monetizing it, it really becomes. You do have to protect the trademark to to maintain it. To a, mm -hmm. a certain degree, but, but yeah. Alex, that's not this kind of call. No, it's it's not about that. No, it's definitely <laughs> not. No, it's not about that. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> like, uh, yeah. So uh, you you can't. You actually have to wear. You have to be fully clothed. Moving on. That's how the trademark works. You're not right, allowed to strip right. down. <laughs> Damn it! Damn it! It's, it's all ruined now. <laughs> that's awesome. Man. Uh, five questions. Well, yeah. Did you have questions, Jeff, or other people have questions? I'm good. I was just curious, what other cool projects are you working on? The data breach stuff is uh, something near and dear to me, but I'm sure you have other stuff. Yeah, the data breach one was a big one in tying that all together. The Probably the biggest thing we're working on right now is what we're calling Baker Street, which is our orchestration platform. So like, there's tons of tools we all use, like Qualys and Nessus and security scanners and Tanium and... 
um, CrowdStrike and all these different tools that all run independently, but there's nothing really binding them together. Like there's ThreadFix and there's a couple other ones, but what we started to do, like we're solving our clients problems and at the same time kind of solving other people's. But that's that's probably one of the cooler ones of taking all these different tools, like a Dratus or anything like that, but instead of just generating paper reports, generating them into a framework so that it all binds together and you can audit everything, but tying this all back to that, what is the framework? What are your policies and procedures? What is your evidence? And then doing the automated evidence collection so that you can shove it all the way back to the framework. So less pen testing, but a platform which starts tying all this stuff together. So could I characterize you as an integrator without any negative implementation on that? Because it sure feels like you like to bring things together and make them cooler than they were when you found them. <laughs> I, uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm co-founder of the company. I was, we were laughing before the call because we share a title of chief innovation officer. And I said, yeah, you actually earned yours. I actually just at, gave myself mine as a co-founder. So I'm, I feel like I'm growing into it a lot more of innovation and integration. We have to live up to our titles for both of each of our own benefits, right? Mm. We, we have to be good so that we can preserve the title of chief innovation officer. Well, I, I think some of it even comes down to like, there's, there's a lot, and again, not talking about, let's talk about mental health now. Like, I think there's, there's so much burnout in our industry, and I think a lot of it's caused by not, not doing what you, not spending most of your time doing what you enjoy. And I think that's one of my role, one of my goals in my role is finding people on my team, finding clients who are struggling in their roles. Like again, it, whether it's a client who's doing their own security stuff or whether it's compliance and framework and all of those things, there's things you hate doing, whether it's writing policies, creating PowerPoints, organizing vulnerability management data. I mean, let's be frank, getting things to compile and build on Linux also contributes to our burnout as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think our goal as as that innovation is finding ways to rip away the junk that no one wants to work on and is burning people out and automating that best we can so people can then do more of what they love and less doing all the junk they don't. Even if that is like automatic PowerPoint creation, which is something we're playing with. Yeah, I, I try and phrase it as automating the workflow or stream streamlining the workflow rather than just saying well you will use automation because people get kind of kind of weird when you phrase it that way i'm like you have a workflow i want to automate as much of that workflow as possible you're still responsible for the workflow we still need humans involved but i want to take away a lot of that burden right as it's kind of you were describing mm -hmm. alex i think that's really what the title means to me anyway no i again i i focus on i want you to be able to do what you love and take all the other junk and help help it into a workflow or even just simple things like again i always felt like this is like 101 like but it it seems that a lot of big companies aren't doing is like building an sop like an actual step-by-step -step guide on how to make here's how we make powerpoints at this company here's how we present data at this company and then once you write the sop you can hand it off to other people to learn from and then you get to focus more on what you love doing. Like I think that is the goal of my job is to let people focus on what they love doing and move the other stuff off. I also, I loved the the t-shirts and slow, speaking of slogans, right? Like hack naked that I'll replace you with a very small shell script. And I really, I think it, you know, it gives the, the kind of what we're talking about a negative connotation almost, but it, it doesn't have that negative connotation because you're, you're freeing up people to do what they love in replacing what they feel is boring with something, a shell script is kind of a, uh, you know, a, a phrase in, in that sense. But I think, uh, you know, that's, that's the heart and soul of it for me, which goes back to kind of a, a tongue in cheek kind of Unix thing. <laughs> right. There, hey, I there remember someone... I did have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go for it. I, I was, I meant to ask it like a half hour ago and I, and I got swept into the conversation. Uh, I was curious, uh, what, uh, kind of markets are you, you know, with your new company, are you finding success in you? Do you, do you cater to any particular industry? The one we've been finding lately has been a lot of healthcare startups, uh, who are dealing with high trust. Like that high trust is huge. 
in its mm-hmm. its in its readiness. Not auditing. We're not. We don't want to be an auditing body. Like we have no want to be an auditing body. What we want to do is help be that that advisor to the client, but also help get them ready so that they're prepped, so that they can get high trust certification. They can get NIST or ISO. And when they get to that point, we can just get, get them ready and we can be their guardian when it comes to that auditing body. Uh, but healthcare startups tend to be like a big one right now, which which we're, we we love. Like they're great. Like they're great to work with because there's so much going on in their industry right now and they need they need to be on high trust. I was waiting for the follow on PCI question, Jeff. Well, uh, because, there is no follow on PCI question because he's clearly not working in the PCI world, uh, and nobody wants to be an auditor. I'm, 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 I'm with you on that. Sorry, sorry to all the auditors out there. We just lost one percent of our audience. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I mean, this goes back anything? to what we were talking about earlier, which is there is someone out there who loves paying taxes and loves dealing with health insurance. I am not one of them. That's not my favorite part of the job, but I I I hire people who love doing what they do and then push that stuff to them. So if someone loves PCI, I they can take PCI. I will help you become PCI, but I really don't want to. <laughs> that's not people. There's that's not real. That's like a unicorn. <laughs> If I have to explain ingress and egress, firewall checking for your CDE, like, oh goodness, scoping that out has been hilarious in some cases because we had a client who we had to define a CDE or your cardholder data environment within a bot. They had a physical box and we had to declare the internal network, the internal parts of that was its own CDE. So it is, it is remarkably obnoxious at times. Wow. Well, this was not a Kubernetes box, right? Or no, <laughs> this was a physical box, and it turned out that they we had to maintain we had to help them maintain documentation across. I think it was like fifty thousand CDEs because that's how many they had distributed. This is this was years ago. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, the irony is you didn't have to because segmentation is not a PCI requirement. Wait, what? You heard me. (laughs) It's not a requirement. No. People use segmentation to do scope control, don't they? Yes. They well, yes. They they use segmentation to uh, relieve the burden of PCI and to uh, to limit the scope, uh, the and really the reach of PCI, which is ironic because PCI was written to be a measurement of a, an organization's security program overall, as it pertained to one specific type of data. Uh, but that's not the way it's been uh, uh, interpreted by many people. That that's the sticking point, though. Right there is how is it how is it interpreted? Because mm-hmm. that's where you. <laughs> I feel like oftentimes auditing feels like getting your, your house inspected is if, if they wake up on the right side of the bed, they have a good cup of coffee, then you're going to, they're going to give you very little hassle yet. If you get a jerk, like they're going to ding you on hundreds and thousands of things and they can do that because there is a lot of interpretation. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we always say like, what is the controls in the framework? What is your policy? What is your procedure? And have all that documented because then you can collect evidence, which then satiates the the procedure, which satiates the policy. And then they're not necessarily auditing what you're doing, but your policies and you ensure your adherence to the policy. But well, and and that's exactly what PCI is designed to do. Uh, But, you know, the second biggest misunderstanding of PCI is is that people think it's an audit process similar to other regulatory, uh, you know, controls. Um, But, you know, it's it's uh, the the big document that I have to fill out as a QSA is called an assessment. 
and uh, it has all sorts of assessment and test procedures, and and it really doesn't mention audit at all, but people kind of lump it into that category of audit, which is where it all begins to unwind as far as I'm concerned. But everything you're describing in terms of uh, building processes, repeatable processes, make sure you having have stuff written down so people can follow it. It doesn't mean that you pick it up and follow it every single time you do your job. It's there as a reference material. You know how to do your job. But if anybody ever had to step in and do your job, uh, you have the steps written down so that they can follow something and they and they, and it's it's provable. That's mm-hmm. the PCI that I do. Uh, and uh, um not everybody does it that way. Let's just say that. Alex, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. This sounds terrifying. Three words to describe yourself. Ooh. That's one. <laughs> I would say uh, hacker, geek, and naked. excitable. I get freaking pumped about learning anything if you were to write a book about yourself what would the title be i get freaking pumped about learning anything naked urinal cake hacker if you were a serial (laughs) killer what would be your weapon of choice you already used the urinal cake darn it an ethernet cable what is your favorite hacker movie hackers choose two celebrities to be your parents Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Ooh. Oh, this is going to be an awkward one. Laurel and Hardy. Ooh. Mm. Oh. It's different. Interesting. First time we've heard that that answer before. So, Alex, Good. thank you so much for hacking naked. Uh, I'm glad I could help you out <laughs> in your career. And uh, thank you for coming on Paul Security Weekly tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Up next, stay tuned. We're going to talk about a mass and attack surface mapping. Stick around. 